Good evening. You're very warmly welcome in the Savior's precious name. Uh, we'll begin tonight with the singing of a hymn, All the Way My Savior Leads Me, What Have I to Ask Beside? Can I doubt His tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in Him to dwell. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. The hymn 430. We'll stand together. Let us wait before the Lord for prayer. We'll seek his face and let's pray that we will know his mercy and hear his voice at this time. O God, we come into thy holy presence in the name of our Savior. We thank you for the gathering together of your people. We thank you for this opportunity to pray and to consider your word and to hear what God would have to say to us. And we pray that we would each of us have open ears and open hearts to your word that we would have a willingness to change and a willingness to be changed, and that the Spirit of God would so work upon our hearts and upon our souls, upon our minds and upon our consciences. And therefore we pray that the Lord would come and enter into this place and descend into this gathering, and that we will know that He is here. Lord, we need you at this time. We need to hear that voice. We need to hear that call of God. And we pray that we would be conscious of that. Receive our thanks for all of your mercies. We thank you for life. We thank you for health and strength. We thank you, Lord, for the scriptures in our natural language. We thank you for the Christ who came to die for us, and we thank you for eternal life. And we rejoice in all of these things, and we pray that you would draw near to us now as we think upon your word. Father, I pray the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, would be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. 
Amen. Amen. Tonight we're turning to the end of Second Chronicles chapter 36. Uh, this is going to be the, the final study in the, the books of Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 36, and we're reading from the verse 21. Second Chronicles 36, and we're reading from the verse 21. to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him an house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. Amen. And we know that God will add his own blessing to the reading of his inspired and infallible word. The, the books of Second Chronicles end on a good note. They end on a, a happy note. Uh, they end with a new day, a new beginning for the, the people of uh, Jerusalem and for the children of Israel who had gone into captivity. Uh, whenever we look back at the previous verses, we see the, the sunset, the, uh, the end of the old day, the end of the, the old civilization. And you read there in verse 19, we are told, and they burnt the house of God and break down the wall of Jerusalem and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. And so the house of God has been broken down. Uh, this study has really revolved around the temple the consecration of the temple, the, the great works that were done within the temple, the construction of the temple, but now we see the condemnation of the temple as the temple is destroyed by the soldiers of, of, of Nebuchadnezzar. But the books of Chronicles were written. The books of Chronicles were written for the people that were returning from the captivity in Babylon. They were written for the people who would return under Zerubbabel and under Ezra and under Nehemiah. And many people actually believe, some scholars believe that uh, Ezra was the writer of the books of Chronicles. And they, they were given in order that the people who returned would know their history, know their past, know about their forefathers, know about the mistakes their forefathers had made, but know about the great reforms that were accomplished under their forefathers. And this was why the books were written, in order that the people who returned would be grounded in their faith. And so the very end of the book of Chronicles ends really with that which brought them out of their captivity, the proclamation that was made by Cyrus, king of Persia, that the people of God might be set free. And there is a, a simple reminder here that God never fails. God never fails to honor His Word. And God never fails to look after His people. And even though things might remain very, very dark for a time, yet a new day will come. And that's the most encouraging thing we learn here from Second Chronicles chapter 36, the dawn of the new day. Sometimes we fail. But when we fail and when we backslide and when we get away from the Lord, He is the one that brings us back and He restores and He forgives and we can return to Him. And here the people are returning. We see the, the great work of the God of grace here in the lives of His ancient people. Let's first of all look at this verse 21, the prophet's uh, promise. And we read here in verse 21 that the Lord had given a word by Jeremiah. The reason why the, the people were brought back under Cyrus was because of God's promise. 
to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. And so Jeremiah gave this promise that there would be a captivity, and the captivity would last no longer than 70 years. Three score and ten years. Let's just look at the, the references in, in Jeremiah uh, that show us this. First of all, we have Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 11 and 12, where we read uh, from the prophet, this whole land shall be a desolation and astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years, and it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans, and will make it perpetual desolation. So after 70 years, Babylon itself would be destroyed. And of course, by the time Cyrus had set the children of Israel free, Babylon was destroyed. So there was a twofold part to the 70 years Babylon, the conqueror of Israel, would be conquered, and then the children of Israel would be set free. But the words of Jeremiah in chapter 29 of Jeremiah, verses 10 to 14, are particularly blessed and happy. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all places, whether I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive." Thoughts of peace and not of evil. I will visit you, perform my good word toward you. And these people here in Second Chronicles 36, after 70 years, they were experiencing that, the performance of God's good word. God was fulfilling his, his promise. But there's a very interesting emphasis here in, in Chronicles 36 and 21. Notice what he says. The reason for the 70 years had to do with the Sabbath. Until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. Now, we know the word Sabbath means to rest. So, the land was forced to rest for 70 years. Now, why 70 years? Why 70 years? Now, we know seven is a very important number. And it, it's associated with Perfection. It's associated with completion. It's associated with rest. It's associated with holiness. For example, God rested the seventh day. And then the Sabbath day was the weekly day of rest, consecrated unto God, a weekly day of rest. And then the seventh year was a, a yearly rest, a yearly Sabbath. And then after seven yearly Sabbaths had passed, seven times seven, 49 years, the 50th year, was the year of Jubilee, and that was a very special yearly, uh, that was a very special uh, Sabbath. So, the, the, the Sabbath was all revolved around multiples of seven. The seventh day, the seventh year, and after seven times seven, there was a special Jubilee year. And all of those occasions were known as the, the Sabbaths. They were the Sabbaths. Now, these days and years had to be kept unto God because they were holy times. But what would happen if the children of Israel failed to keep these Sabbaths? Would there be consequences? There would be, and there were grave consequences. Turn with me over to the book of Leviticus 26 and the verse 33. We read there, God said, And I will scatter you among the heathen, and will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths. As long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemy's land, even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. As long as it lieth desolate, shall rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when ye dwelt upon it. In other words, if you don't celebrate my Sabbaths, I will take you into the enemy land, and the land will have her Sabbath. I'll take my Sabbath. The Sabbath that you wouldn't give to me, I'll take that Sabbath, 
and you will pay the price for your disobedience. And that's an unspeakably solemn thought. There in the days of Moses, this warning was solemnly given. The people would not rest in their Sabbaths. The land would rest. The people would suffer. God will always take what is his. Now, we know from the reading of the prophets that one of the sins that was committed in these years leading up to the captivity was a neglecting of the Sabbaths. Um, Jeremiah talked about this. We won't go into it now, but in Jeremiah 34, Jeremiah talked about how the people had neglected the Sabbath. And even in the days of Isaiah, very long before the time of Jeremiah, that was a, a clearly a problem. The people were not keeping the Sabbaths. You look at the minor prophets, you will find in this period of history, the people did not keep the Sabbaths. And whenever the Sabbath is referred to, it's not only referred to the seventh day, it's referring to the seventh year, it's referring to the Jubilee. The people were not doing what God had wanted. And therefore, God took his Sabbath and forced the land to rest. And you can see this picture. There were, there were years when the, the oxen were in the fields on the Sabbath day. There were years when the slaves were not released in the year of release. There were years when the people were not worshiping God as they should. And God said, I'll deal with you. The land will have her 70 years, her 70 years of Sabbath, and you will learn the lesson. You know, God restored Israel, yes, but they had a price to pay for their sin. And that's true of our relationship with God today. Yes, when we sin and when we feel the Lord, there is a God of restoration, but there is also the price of sin, the consequences of sin. And God does take what is His. If we withhold obedience, he can exact that obedience, obedience from us. Lead us down a difficult road. Hedge our way with thorns in order that we might humble ourselves before God. If we act with pride, he can humble us. If we don't pay our tithe, he can bring the business low. If we sin in private, he can expose that sin to public view. Because God is not mocked. And whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And those whom he loves, he chastens. That we might be partakers of his holiness. And we see this worked out in the experience of God's ancient people. And so we have, first of all, the prophet's promise. But let's also think about the emperor prepared. Because we come to verse 22 now, and we see in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, so Cyrus is now in the throne. Babylon is defeated. In order that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. And so you get a sense that God was stirring up this man in order that his word might be fulfilled. God was taking a dealing with the most powerful man in the world in order that his people might be set free. For now was the time when God's people would be uh, released. You know, twice in history, God has restored Israel to her homeland by working in the hearts of the great world powers. On May the 14th, 1948, David Ben-Gurion declared Israel as an independent nation. And on the very same day, and it was critical, President Harry Truman recognized the new state. And out of the ashes of World War II, when there was that horrible and horrific attempt to exterminate the world of Jews, when the population of Jews across the world was halved during the awful Holocaust, out of the ashes of that, God was at work preparing for a new beginning for those Jewish people. And they haven't realized the full benefit of that yet, for they still have not accepted that Christ is their Messiah. But here in Second Chronicles chapter 36, we have the first time that God worked in the heart of a great world power in order that his people might be restored to their homeland. Cyrus the Persian emperor. His heart, his spirit was stirred up by God. Now, the amazing thing about Cyrus is centuries earlier, and it was centuries, Isaiah spoke about Cyrus, mentioned his very name. It's a great passage 
in Isaiah chapter 45, verses 1 to 4, where Cyrus is called the anointed of the Lord. He's called a man whose right hand has been held by God. He's called a man whom God has subdued the nations before him. And God says to Cyrus, I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass, cut in sunder the bars of iron. I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places. Thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel for Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect. I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. And Cyrus was not a man who sought after God, but yet God knew this man, and God raised up this man in order that his people might be set free. And you know, this should encourage our hearts. Whatever's going on in the world, God is at work. We think of the situation in the UK. We'll have a new prime minister in a few weeks' time. Who's that going to be? Well, God's working in the midst of all of that. And whether they know God or not, God will fulfill His purposes. And that's the God that He is. And it's true of our own lives, individually and personally. God has a plan for us, a good purpose for us. He had a purpose for Cyrus. But God has a purpose for His people, His people who know Him, His people that love Him. A plan that He will fulfill. A plan that He will always bring to pass. And the children of Israel, you know, they were instructed to pray this promise from Abraham, from Jeremiah might be fulfilled. And in Jeremiah, he, he taught them, look, you're to pray that this word will come to pass. You have the promise. Just don't sit back and think it's going to come. You, you've got to pray that the promise will be realized. You know, the greatest of prayers that we can offer are the prayers that we know are going to be answered. The prayers, we have God's promise. We have God's promise. And these people had God's promise. And one man in particular who prayed, who prayed over the 70 years, who, who prayed over the words of Jeremiah, was Daniel. And you read through Daniel chapter 9, and you read about that great prayer that he offered. He got God's word before him, and he prayed, and he prayed that Israel would be returned to their homeland. Let's pray that God will honor all of his promises and will fulfill his word. Let's pray to that end, because that is a prayer that will be answered. Finally, let's think about the imperial proclamation. And we have this proclamation that he made in the verse 23. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia. Cyrus was saying it, but God was saying it. God had written the decree. He had put it into the heart of the king. All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him and let him go up. You know, Cyrus was a Gentile, and yet he had a concept of God's sovereignty. He had a, a concept of God's dominion over the world. He had a concept of man's stewardship. He understood that he was a, a man who had only been loaned his empire by God, and therefore he was accountable to God for this empire. All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me. You know what? a theological view this man had of the God of Israel. And whenever he said to the children of Israel, you can go free, it wasn't just about them having their homes back, having the inheritance of their fathers back, having their farms back, their land back, their city back. It wasn't just about that. It was about having the temple back, a place to worship God, for this was the only place where sacrifices could be offered. And notice what he said. God hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among all his people? The Lord is God, be with him, let him go up. And it's an incredible thing to see this Gentile king, and he's challenging God's people. Who is there among you? Who's going to be obedient? Who's going to go up? Because don't forget, it was a tough decision to make to return for some people. They had been living in Babylon. They had been born in that place. They had businesses in that place. They had settled hopes in that place. And they were called to leave that and go across the miles to a city where there was nothing, where the walls had been broken down, to start afresh again, to start from scratch. And some went, but many didn't go. The first wave went through Zerubbabel. Then there was another wave of people that went through Ezra. They went in stages. But they went in order that God's work might be established 
once again. In Isaiah 44 and 28, we read of Cyrus. Thus saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure. Even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. And it is quite evident that Cyrus's burden was that the foundation of the temple might be laid again. And this was what the new beginning was all about. The glory of God, the worshiping of God. And when you read the book of Ezra, you'll read that it was all about the building of the temple, the erection of the temple once again. Now, establishing a new civilization is not easy work. Establishing Jerusalem was tough. It was discouraging. There were many adversaries. There were those that would try and stop them or those that would try and hinder them. And they built the foundation and then they had to leave it for a while because they were discouraged. And then Haggai and Zechariah came along and they encouraged them to start the work again. And so the work restarted until the temple was erected once again. And you know, there were those amongst even the children of Israel at that time and they despised the work they were doing. And they thought to themselves, this work that we're doing is not as great as the work that was done in the days of Solomon. This temple is not as great as the temple that Solomon built. And I'm sure architecturally and in relation to beauty, it wasn't as great. And there were those that could remember the old temple, the older people, they actually wept for it just wasn't as good. And they saw the day in which they lived as a despised bunch of people living in that land that was desolate, that hadn't been inhabited for 70 years. They they felt they were living in a day of small things. And yet God gave them a word in Haggai 2, verses 7 to 9. He said, the latter house will be greater than the former. This house that you're building will be greater than the former house. You know why that was? Because the desire of all nations would come and fill the house with glory. Something happened to that temple that was built in the days of Zerubbabel that did not happen to Solomon's temple. Christ came, walked its precincts. Christ came to that very temple. And that's what we long for this place. That's what we long for our hearts here, that the Lord's glory would come and fill the house and fill our hearts even tonight as we come to pray. We should never despise the age in which God has placed us. We should never despise or decry the little that we seem to be able to do for the Lord, because little is much when the Lord is in it. In this day of small things, the other great prophet of the exiles who returned, Zechariah, encourages us greatly. Because in Zechariah 4, in the verse 6, we read, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who hath despised the day of small things? It's not what we do, it's what God does through us. It's His power, it's His spirit. It's his fullness. Yes, it was a very uh, diverse pathway the Lord led Israel through days of apostasy and days of revival and days of chastening, days of judgment, but there was a new beginning. There was a new day that arrived. God did a new work amongst his people. And let's pray that God will do a new work in our hearts and here in this house, even tonight as we pray. The desire of all nations will come and dwell with us. And we'll thought a little upon Israel tonight. And let's pray for God's chosen people that God would return them again, that they would see the one whom they have pierced, mourn for him, and that they would be restored to the Messiah. As we believe, the promises of God would lead us to. And let's get before the Lord for prayer. Let's seek the Lord's face together. Really appreciate you joining us. Those that have joined us for the Bible study through live stream, we bid you farewell. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and do remember the work here in, in your prayers. As we come to pray uh, tonight, uh, do please uh, pray for the meetings in the Lord's Day. Pray that we'll know the Lord's presence, we'll know the Lord's voice. Pray also for um, the outreach at Clocker Valley Show and the Clocker Valley Show will take place next Wednesday. So pray for the outreach and pray for the, 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 the literature that will be distributed and that uh, we've prepared a video for that that's going to be shown to those that come to the uh, uh, gazebo during the, during the show, but um, we'll also be releasing that on social media and pray that God will bless that short video. It's a little conversation uh, between myself and Brother Neville Robinson, Sister Ruth Andrews, and, and uh, there's some uh, drone footage of, of silage and 
and harvest and uh, that, that Craig has done and uh, we're, we're going to use that just to talk about the cost of living crisis and, and the problems that people have and the need to trust the Lord and to depend upon Him. So just pray, pray for that, that it will be used for the glory of God and to touch hearts and to reach souls because there's so many in our community and there's so much worry and fear at this present time and, and yet we have the answer for all of that. We don't have the answer for all the economic problems. Nobody does but God, but we know how one can have peace in the midst of the storm and that's through Christ. Pray for all those that are out of Christ attached to our church and in our families that God will restore families uh, to himself and let's pray for the sick and for those that are infirm that God will be be with them. So let's get before the Lord now, seek his face. We'll ask our brother Neville McElrath just to lead us in prayer and then one after another let's wait upon the Lord and call upon his name.